Okay, we've been talking about the Father, God, scriptures call him God, Jesus calls him Father quite often, but also refers to him as God. When God is referred to, we're talking about the Father, the Creator, the one who has the plans, the one who has the precedence over all. The Father, without going over the whole, well, without going any, of the history of how how God the Father dealt with his people over the years, over the centuries, God promised that he would send someone to straighten things out. He promised he would send someone to establish a new arrangement, a new agreement, a new covenant or testament with his people. And certain things were said about it. The prophets spoke about this one who was to come and so on. Turned out to be Jesus, as we know. But when these things were spoken and written, people did not understand to whom they referred, really, what this was all about. But they were, they were expecting, they are people of expectation, that someone would come and make a difference sometime in the future. And these things then were recorded in, in the, the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, again and again. For example, I just copied down a few of them here from the book of Daniel, chapter 7, 13, and so on. It says this, I see one like a son of man. Son of man is one like a man, but perhaps not altogether a man. Hmm. It's, a, it's a phrase that's hard to define. I see one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. He will receive dominion, glory, and kingship. Nations and peoples of every language will serve him. His dominion will be everlasting, and it will not be taken away, and his kingship shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 13. In Isaiah chapter 9, starting at the beginning of the chapter, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. I think this is read at Christmas time, if I'm not mistaken. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. Upon his shoulder dominion rests. If you're familiar with Handel's Messiah, you'll, re you'll recall those words and the music that they're set to. They will call him Wonder Counselor, God Hero, Father Forever, and Prince of Peace. In Isaiah chapter 53, that was Isaiah 9 and 53, but he will be without beauty, without majesty, no looks to attract us to him. He will be despised and rejected by men. He will be a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. And yet ours will be the sufferings he bears. He will be pierced for our faults, for our sins, crushed for our sins. And through his wounds, we will be healed. These things weren't all understood by the people at that time. Psalm 22, which is the most remarkable, I think, perhaps the most remarkable piece in Scripture. Are you familiar with Psalm 22? I know you are. If you're not familiar with it, perhaps you might try reading it fairly soon. It's, it's a bit long. Don't let that phase you. It's quite interesting. I won't read it. I'll just a few lines here. Maybe you'd be saying to yourself, well, that's what, that's, that refers to, yeah, hmm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my prayer, from the words of my cry. I am a worm, not a man. The scorn of men, despised by the people. All who look at me scoff. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. They say he relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he loves him. Many bullocks surround me. The strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me. I am like water poured out. All my bones are racked. My heart is melting away within my bosom. My throat is dried up like baked clay. 
My tongue cleaves to my jaws. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They have divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they have cast lots. These, of course, I'm sure you will recognize, are words in the mouth of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. And yet this, the Psalms, I guess, were written about a thousand years before. Was it a thousand years? Don't hang me up on a few hundred years, you know. It was a long time before it happened that these words were written. When Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We are left to conclude that he actually feels his father has forgotten him. I don't agree with that. I think he was simple, not simply, but he was just reciting Psalm 22, which referred to him. It was written hundreds and hundreds of years before. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. I think that, that perhaps if one didn't have faith and was looking for a reason to, to check it out, that alone might provide some reason. How could somebody writing all that time beforehand use the words that applied to this Jesus who came hundreds of years after? I want to check that out. I think anybody who's an honest doubter needs to check out quite a few things and not just say, ha ha, I don't believe that stuff. That's not good enough. Not good enough, I don't think. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. It's all about love. God is love. The father sent Jesus, although he knew. Father has foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen. And he sent his son Jesus knowing, knowing that we were going to put him up on the cross. He knew that, and yet he sent him anyway. And it's love. It's called love. That's not what we call love. That's what we call madness. We would never send our children, our son, even grown sons or daughters out there to get beaten up. Never. Let alone killed and abused. And yet the Father sent Jesus just that way. It's called love. Love is total giving. It's total giving. Asking nothing in return. There can be no greater love, Jesus said himself. That a man give away his life for his friends, and he did it. All out of love. Now, why it had to be done, we'll, we'll perhaps hopefully get to the point where we can say a few things about that. Jesus was born of a virgin, we know, the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea. He was brought up in Nazareth, which is in Galilee in the north, the more obscure part of Palestine at the time. He lived perhaps about 30 years at home, which was considerably longer than young men lived at home in those days. And then he went on the road with an obvious mission. He believed he had a mission. He went on the road to get it done. And he spoke the words. He spoke the words of life. He said, I have the words of life. And it took about three years, and he wound up on the cross. The sign for the world, I guess, of defeat. The sign, however, for believers of victory. Because he took everything on himself and had it nailed to the cross with him. And then, of course, by the power of the Holy Spirit, rose from the dead. Death no longer, death no longer could win. What looks to us like the end has become, through the work of Jesus, has become the doorway, the gateway to eternal life. Not the end at all. It's the gateway through which we pass to eternal life. Anyway, Jesus did different things in his public ministries. We talk about that a bit. He proclaimed the good news. He healed the sick and delivered the demonized, set people free from evil spirits. Number three, he founded the church. Number four, he suffered died and was raised from the dead. Number five, 
He sent the Holy Spirit. Those are the main things that he did. I'll make this proposition that because the Father has sent Jesus with the mandate that he gave him, it is the task of each of us, particularly those of us who are Christian, those of us who are Catholic, who have roots right back in the apostolic age. It, it, it has to be that we must come to terms with this, this person, this man, Jesus. We must come to terms with him. We well, can't just say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic, and let it go with that. We have to come to terms with him. We have to take him at his word. There's no point in just, just taking this bit and this bit and that bit. It's a little smorgasbord put together and carried along. We have to come to terms with him. What did he say? What did he ask for? Am I going to respond to that? Or am I going simply to ignore it? Our faith is not so much a membership in the church, a membership in an organization. In some ways, the church is an organization because there are all kinds of people in it. It has to be organized. Too bad, but it has to be. It's got to be organized. You can't let them all, everybody just do anything or nothing. It's got to be some kind of, so it's not just membership in an organization. That's not what our faith is. Hello, the Father wants us to belong to the church, fairly obviously. It's not so much following a set of rules like the commandments, the law. That's important, of course. But our faith is not so much that, but rather our faith is essentially a relationship with a person, a, the person of Jesus Christ. He's the one. It's relating to him that is the essence of our faith. And it's like, how, how does that happen? How do we get in touch with that? Well, it's the dynamic again, the one, two, three sort of thing. John 1, 12. John, the beloved disciple, writes this. To those who accepted him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who accepted him, he gave power to become children of God. The human person hears the, the word, hears the invitation, decides to answer it. I accept that, I take it. I choose it. Please give me that. And then he gave power. That's the Holy Spirit. He gave power to become sons and daughters of God, children of God. So that's, that's how we do it. How do we come to faith? We ask for it. We ask for it. A Protestant uh, preacher of long standing who's now uh, deceased, uh, who was much admired on, by people of all Christian faiths and others, I guess, said this, and it's very, very true. God has no grandchildren. He has only children. Sad as it may seem, parents cannot give the faith to their children. They can't. Teachers can't give it to their students. Pastors can't give it to their parishioners. Nobody can give it to anybody else. It has to come directly from God. The faith is a gift from God to the individual. Parents can't pass it on. What parents can do is to try to prepare the ground so that the son, the daughter, is, is ready, somehow ready to say yes. You know, like how do you, that, that's quite a, quite a challenge, bringing up children. Some of you are bringing up children, I suspect. Some of you have brought up children, I suspect. Maybe they haven't all bought the whole thing. Maybe they haven't all bought any of it. Maybe they've walked. They've taken a walk. They're gone as far as the church, as long as faith is concerned. Maybe those, those of you who have children who have done that, I wonder, what did I do wrong? Ah, oh, it's not your fault. The world is too strong now. The pull of the world is too strong for even the average good believing family. A generation ago, the strong Christian Catholic family was sufficient to protect the children, and somehow the offspring had a better chance to come to believe and receive faith. Now it doesn't work as well. Even the strongest families find that they're not strong enough to hold them. We have to realize that the faith comes from God alone and not from us. So what do you do with them? Well, 
If you're religious, if you're Christian, if you're Catholic, they better have a good opinion of you. If you come across as some, you know, ogre with a stick, you know, and you go to church on Sunday, they're liable not to be very impressed. But when it comes time to choose whether they're going to go with this whole thing or not, they'll probably choose not to. I don't envy the task of parents bringing up children today. I don't. I really don't. If I had some keen clues to give you, I'd give them. I think what we need to do, if we're trying to find out how to do it, is to talk to people for whom it seems to have worked. But what did you do? Or what did you avoid? How, you know, like, how does it work? And so on. Anyways, Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will but open the door, I will come in, sit down, and have supper. Intimacy with God. Friendship with God. That's what he wants. The Father wants to, to sit us on his knee. He wants to dandle us on his knee, as it were. He wants us to be able to stroke his long gray beard if he has one. You know, that kind of stuff. We, he wants us to be able to call him dad. Hey, pops, how about it? Here's another day. Can I sit in your knee to begin the day? Of course you can, my little princess. Or my boy. You're my boy. That's a my boy. <laughs> you know? That's what he wants. He wants that. He wants intimacy. That's what Jesus is saying. If you will open the door, I will come in and sit down and have supper. Eating together is a sign of intimacy and friendship. That's what it means. Who was this Jesus? Philippians 2, 6 and following. St. Paul writes, He did not cling to godliness. This is Jesus he's talking about. But he emptied himself and took the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. Who was he? Who was this man? This is the question. This is the question we must answer. Who was he? Who was he? Who is he for me? Who is this fellow? I have to figure that out. I have to receive that. I have to come to, to, to terms with that. Well, the claim is Jesus' own claim and the belief of the church from the beginning is that he was the divine son of the Father. Nothing less than a member of the Godhead itself. That's who Jesus was and is. That's what we believe, that's what we teach. St. Paul writes in different places. In Colossians, in 1.15, he says, he is the visible likeness of the invisible Father. Want to know what the Father looks like? Look at Jesus, that's what he looks like. Want to know what the Father is like? He's like Jesus. He's like Jesus who, who came upon the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. The man getting away, of course, as men always do. You know? But the woman was caught, sure enough, there she is. And the law says, the, you know, the, the heavies said, the law says, they reported, that such a person must be stoned to death. What do you say, rabbi? Which means teacher, right? He was, he was a teacher. He's called rabbi quite often. What do you say, rabbi? That was quite a scene, quite a scene. If you see Jesus sort of putting his, his finger up to his chin and as though mulling it over, and looking off in the distance and then saying to them, let whichever one of you has no sin at all, throw the first stone. And of course they're all saying, Ooh, uh, yeah, well, uh, and then he bends down. That's the most, one of the most fascinating parts of it. He bends down and he writes in the dust with his finger. And one of the gospel writers says, beginning with the eldest and going right down to the youngest, they all dropped the stones and walked away. 
So what was he writing in, in the sand? Bishop Sheen says, I don't know if he knew, but it sounded pretty good to me when I heard it. He was probably writing in the sand the predominant sin of each one. As the eldest one looked over, adulterer. And the next one, forger, you know, embezzler, etc., and all that kind of stuff. And they all walked away. And he says to the woman, has anybody stayed around to condemn you? No, master. Well, neither do I. Go off now, but don't sin anymore. He didn't say, it doesn't matter. Have a good time, girl. Hit the road. He didn't say that. But he was so loving and so forgiving, you know. And off she went. But he said, don't sin anymore, you know. Liable to happen to you again. Don't sin again. Anyway, we'll talk about a little sin maybe a little later. John calls him in his, uh, his gospel, the very first verse of his gospel, John 1.1, 1, 1, calls him the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. That's an odd expression for a person. You are the Word. Well, if the Father, I remember a, a professor in, in college teaching this, and I think he put it in a way that was probably as good as anything I've heard. He said this, if the Father could be seen as the eternal idea, the expression of an idea is a word then the Son is the eternal Word. And somehow, like the image, this is an image, eh? This is, an Im this is a way of trying to understand who Jesus is. He's the Word of God. He's the expression of the Father. Who was this man? The divine Son of God. St. Paul writes again in Colossians 2.9 this time, in him, he says, the fullness of divinity dwells. The fullness of divinity dwells in him. One like a son of man, Revelation 1.13. It says in my notes here to read this. So I must have decided when I was preparing this that this was fairly significant and that I should pardon the condition of the Bible, by the way. It's barely hanging on. And I know some of you say, well, why don't you get another Bible? Actually, I do have a few others. But I use this one all the time because I have it all, you know, highlighted. And boy, that's quite a job to highlight a whole Bible. That's taken a lot of time over the years. I just hate to, uh, you know, maybe the cover could be taken off and a whole new cover put on, eh? Maybe some of you know somebody who could do that? <laughs> anyway, that's why I hang on to this poor battered old Bible that I have here and I've lost my place. Revelation 1, 13. There it is. Revelation is the last book in the Bible, by the way. 13. I saw seven lampstands of gold. This is highly symbolic language. Highly symbolic. You don't just pick this up and say, oh yeah, right, look, oh, I understand that. Ooh, 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 ooh. No, you have to know what the symbols mean. It's highly symbolic. It's conceptual. The, the symbols are, are conceptual. They're not literal. Okay, anyway, we could talk about that some other time. I saw seven lampstands of among the lampstands, one like a son of man. That's one of the titles Jesus used for himself. He referred to himself as the son of man, didn't he? So often. Wearing an ankle length robe with a sash of gold. The hair of his head was white as snow white wool, and his eyes blazed like fire. His feet gleamed like polished brass, refined in a furnace, and his voice sounded like the roar of running waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. A sharp, two-edged sword came out of his mouth. Now, that doesn't make a very interesting picture. It's a conceptual symbol, not literal. It means something. And you might say, well, okay, you read that, but like, what does that mean? I mean, you can't read that and say, oh, yeah, well, polished brass. Say, oh, yeah, I know what that means. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, like the roar of, of rushing waters, fine. Yeah, the two-edged sword, oh, one, oh really, two-edged sword, there it is. I know all that stuff. Well, no, we don't know all that stuff. We have to learn about it. But the point of that is that, he, that John uses in the book of Revelation as he writes it, under the, uh, the impetus of the Holy Spirit, he writes it using these descriptions for Jesus, which appear in the Old Testament, in the Jewish scriptures, in the book of Daniel, somewhere here, from Daniel 7. And when Daniel wrote them, they referred to God alone. God alone. He is the one with the eyes blazing like fire, with the long white robe, with the golden sash, and so on. That was God. That was God. You know, people will come to your door, will they? And they have Bibles in their hands. They say, you're Catholic, are you? As you say, yes. Well, do you go to church? Yes. I'm Catholic. Oh, oh, oh. You, you're, you're in bad shape. You believe that Jesus is the divine. Oh, well, he isn't. You know, and they'll quote a few verses here and there. You take out your Bible, you turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and you read this. Does that make any impression on you, you might say? Well, no. Well, then turn to Daniel chapter 7 and read that. Those expressions refer to God alone. Alone. And when John uses these, referring to Jesus, he is saying very simply, Jesus is equal to God. He is divine. That's what you do. Will you remember that, do you think? Okay. Because as sure as we're, as we're standing and sitting here, uh, the people will come back to your door at some point and uh, accost you for being uh, Catholic. You know, there you go. To the one, Revelation 5, 12, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb, equal praise and honor and glory. The one seated on the throne, that's God, the Father, and the Lamb, that's Jesus. To both, equal praise, equal praise. Jesus is divine. We can learn many, many lessons from Jesus, I think. However, the best lesson we can learn, I think the best one I've learned from him, as well as, you know, confessed him and claimed him to be my Savior and my Lord, Probably the best lesson I, I've learned from him is, comes out of these lines here. My food, he says, John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. If only, if only, if only I could do the will of the Father all the time, my goodness what he could do through me. If only you, or maybe you do, perhaps you are doing the will of the Father all the time. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but let's face it, we don't really make it, do we? We don't always do the will of the Father. We do our own will so much, quite apart from what God might want. But only if we could do that. How, how wonderfully, how powerfully, how effectively he could work through us for others for others, for our children, for heaven's sake, for our families, for our parents, for our brothers and sisters, our partners at work or at school, what he could do through us. You see, the will of God, the will of the Father, is the only thing that's worth doing. Nothing else in this world is worth doing at all except the will of God. And besides that, nothing else works anyway. So why do we fight it? We're so willful, right? We're so determined somehow inside. We're, we're partners, we're participators rather, in a, in a flawed nature. There's something the matter with us. You know, I say, there's something the matter with me. You know, everybody says, that. oh, we know that. There's something the matter with us. We're flawed. Read what, what John says. Is it? Hold on here now. Paul, rather. Paul says in chapter 7 of Romans, where he talks about how he wants to do the right thing, but he doesn't have the power to do it. The things I want to do, I wind up not doing. I have difficulty doing those things. The things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. There's a war going on inside me, he says. There's a war. We know that. We know there's a war going on inside us. 
drawing us to do things that are, that are destructive, not at all constructive, things that are sinful, as we call them, those things that are against the law of God, which is given to us to show us the pattern in how to live, and so on. But we fight it, we fight it. But only if only we could do the will of the Father, you know. Jesus always did it, always did it. You might say, well, that's fine for him. He was divine. He didn't have any sin to start with. Well, that's true. But he had a lot to put up with, right? A lot to put up with, and he did it anyway, even to death on a cross. The will of the Father, the only thing worth doing, it's connected with the kingdom of God. Jesus talked about the kingdom. I don't know how many examples he gave of the kingdom, right? The kingdom of God is near you. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is, is close. The kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God, this is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like this, that, and the other thing. The kingdom of God, can we define that? The kingdom of God is this. Let me define it. The kingdom of God is that person or place. The kingdom of God exists in a person or a place where the will of God the Father is done perfectly. That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God operates in me perfectly if I do everything that the Father wants. Then the kingdom of God is within me. The kingdom of God is coterminous with heaven. Because in heaven, the will of the Father is always done. So the kingdom of God is the same thing as heaven. The kingdom of God is not the same thing as the church, because the will of the Father is not always done in the church. We're the church. Not always done in us. The kingdom of God is the, exists in the person or the place where the will of the Father is done perfectly. So. The kingdom of God admits of, of degrees. The kingdom of God is operating in me at about 30%. Operating in you about 70%, let's say, or whatever. Whatever it is. It, it's like that. The kingdom, it's, it's what God wants. In the Our Father, when Jesus taught us how to pray, gave us that formula, he said, pray like this, Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God can exist here on earth. It can. We're to pray for that, to strive for that. You know, some people will say, well, why should we pray that God's will get done? Isn't it always done? Well, that's the problem. The will of the Father is not always done. That's the main human problem. The will of God is not getting done here. It's not getting done much at all. You know, that perhaps there's a you know, bad plane crash over the Rocky Mountains or something, and a plane goes down and 400 people are killed, tragedy, and somebody will say, well, it was God's will. God, God willed it. Well, no, he didn't. God doesn't want that type of thing to happen. He does, he permits it. That's not the same thing as wanting it. You know, if, you're, if your youngster uh, wants to do something and you, you don't want him to do it or her to do it, but you also, you know you can't, like you're going to get into further trouble if you don't let them do it. So you say, well, okay, go ahead. You permit it, but you don't want it. God doesn't want those things. Those things come about because we live in a sinful world, and that's why they happen. So we're to pray that God's will be done on earth here as it is being done in heaven, for sure. John 5, 19, Jesus says, the son does only what he sees the father doing. I'm talking about the lesson that I have tried to learn most from Jesus, and that is to do the father's will. Do the will of the father. That's so important. Your will be done. Every day I say that, every night before I fall asleep. Lord, your will be done, not mine. I mean, I, I'm trying to mean it, but I mean, there are some things that I prefer to be done, you know. And it's, there's no problem asking for those, but to say, Lord, your will be done. Anyway, that's the pathway to, uh, you know, to sanctity, I guess, huh? to sanctity. So many things to learn. So many things to learn, let's say, in, in the scriptures. You know, in the New Testament, the Gospels and so on, we could study this line and that line, the other line. 
That's, that's Bible study. This is not Bible study, what we're doing now. This is trying to, trying to urge you, trying to perhaps instruct you in some of the things that you may have wondered about, in some of the things that you may need to know in order to take the next step, to follow along after Jesus, your master, your Lord, your rabbi. Watch what God does and do it with him. Was it Buddha that said, I know the way? Was it Mohammed that said, I see the way? It was Jesus who said, I am the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In Acts 4.12, Peter, I think, says, I think it's Peter, no, there is no salvation in any other name under heaven. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. And we've got to understand that. Does that mean people who are not Christians can't be saved? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that if Jesus had not done what he did, nobody could be saved. But because he has done what he has done, the opportunity is there for us all to reach our fulfillment in heaven with God. All. It's easier when one, remember one fellow said, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus said, try to enter by the narrow gate. Because there are so many trying to find their way on the wide road, and they're not making it. Not too many of them are making it that way. Try to enter by the narrow gate. What's that? That's himself. He said at another time, I am the gate through which the sheep come out. You know. So the sure way. The sure way to salvation is through Jesus, through knowing him, through following him, through making a commitment to him. That's the sure way. The other way, well, that's the law, the law that's written in our hearts. As we're created by God in our hearts, basically we know, by and large, what's right and what isn't, what's wrong. Well, follow that. Another time, it was the same time, the fellow asked, what must I do to be saved? He said, keep the commandments. That's what he's saying. Follow the law. Not easy. That's not easy. He uh, may not make it that way. Try to enter by the narrow gate. That's Jesus himself. So if someone who is not Christian is, is saved and enters into glory, it is through the merits of Jesus Christ, because he or she has followed to the best of his or her ability, the law of God, written in the heart. It's at the end there, it's towards the end of Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus says at the end, they will all be lined up before me. On the left, the goats, on the right, the sheep. And he will say to the ones on his right, blessed are you. Enter into the kingdom of your father. You know, and there they all are, they don't all know him. So how is it, like, like, what do you mean? Well, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was lonely and whatever, you came and visited. When I was in prison, you visited me, and so on. I said, well, we don't even know you. When did we ever do that for you? When you did it to one of the least of mine, you did it to me. Enter into glory, into the, into the salvation, the eternal salvation waiting for you with your Father. <clears throat> the capture of the human heart, the greatest of all mysteries, the greatest act of God's power, capturing a human heart, a stubborn heart that will not believe. For the Lord to enter into that heart, that soul, and change it, that's the greatest act of God's power. It took more power for Jesus to bring about conversion in the heart of Mary Magdalene than it did for him to raise Lazarus from the dead. More power. Sometimes people say, well, we're not seeing the power of God around here. You know, like how many people have got up out of wheelchairs in this church? How many people have had healings of physical things? Well, some. Sure, some. Maybe we need more, more testimonies, fine. 
But there's power, of course there's power, because people's lives are being changed. People's lives, that's, that's an incredible act of the power of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen it again and again and again. I remember when I was here, perhaps but a year, year and a half, a year and a half, and I didn't know what I was doing. Says you, what's new about that? <laughs> know what I was, didn't know what to do, panicking and consulting the Lord, give me permission, he said, to do what I want to do. I thought he was saying, I said, fine. You want my permission, you got it. If you've got some clues as to what to do here, take over because I haven't got any. So please take over the whole directorship of this operation. And I, I guess he did, because he began to convert people in the pews, began to convert them. And there was, a, there was, there was religious experience taking place. People were experiencing a conversion in their hearts as they sat, as they walked away, as they drove home as they, they remembered what was said or what was celebrated. They were converted. And in their eagerness then, they brought others in. The crowd began to grow. The people coming in began to get more enthused about what they were doing, and the celebrations began to take off. That's what happened. I didn't do it. I didn't pump it up. I'm not like that. I'm a very low-key guy. I'm quiet. You know, I didn't say, come on, gang, let's start shouting and stomping our feet down. Boom, boom, boom. I didn't do that. I'd be petrified to do something like that. <laughs> I'd be left all by myself, you know, stamping my feet with them all looking at me as much as to say, well, this guy's had it. <laughs> this fellow's lost it. Too bad, eh? He was a nice fellow at one time. I remember he loved him on. You know, that's, that's not what happened. It was, it was something that God did. In Colossians 2.14, St. Paul wrote, he canceled the bond that stood against us with all its claims, snatching it up and nailing it to the cross. Thus did God disarm the principalities and powers, the forces of evil. He made a public show of them. A public show of them. Oh, well, good for you. Leading them off captive, triumphed in the person of Christ. When he went to the cross, he took our sins upon himself. And as Father Bill is fond of saying, he became sin for us. He became sin. He took it on. He took it away from us and, and cleaved it to himself and went to the cross. And it killed him. It killed him. I think the actual human thing that killed him was a broken heart. Because he knew that in spite of the fact that he would do all this, Still, many people wouldn't care. People that he loved so madly wouldn't care. I think that's what killed him at the end. He was so weak physically and so on. The Lamb of God, pierced for our offenses, founded the church on Peter, remains its head, lives to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7. And he will, finally then, he will come again. Jesus will come again, not as the suffering servant that he came as in the first place, fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah in Psalm 22, but as the all-conquering king, the one that Paul writes about in Philippians 2, before whom every knee will bend, every head will bow, every tongue will acclaim Jesus Christ as Lord for the glory of God the Father. That's who he'll be, the conquering king, Coming on the clouds, Jesus says himself in Matthew 24, 30. Coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and majesty. That's who he'll be. He'll be the conquering king. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. He will come again. And you and I will all participate in that day. Am I saying it's going to happen in three years and four months? No, I'm saying that. Whether we're beyond this, this mortal coil or still on it, we will participate in that day. And that will be the final victory for our God. Oh, I can't wait for that. That's fantastic. Every knee will bow, whether they like it or not. There won't be any debates about it. There won't be any television interviews and stuff like that. 
What do we questions about? Only be only any you know pickets and so on. Go back to heaven. Go back. You know, <laughs> there'd be nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. Every tongue will acclaim. Every tongue will acclaim, whether they like it or not. Jesus Christ is Lord, for the glory of God the Father. That's who He is.